Good morning. Two weeks ago, we looked at Philippians chapter 1, and we talked about how the Apostle Paul's heart could be full of joy even while he was under house arrest in Rome. And we mentioned that he had already been in custody probably for two to three years before that, and probably in much worse conditions uh, back in Jerusalem. But he writes with joy. So we asked, how can a man be joyful with so many limitations put on him, since we're living in a time of limitations? Well, we mentioned that even while confined, his mind and his heart were free. Paul had already submitted himself to God's will, and his love for the saints who were still ministering for the Lord in freedom gave him a a, a deep contentment. Paul's internal life could transcend his bleak external conditions and bring him joy. And that joy was found in the fellowship he had with his beloved, though far away, church family. He had not seen them for years, but he communicated with them by letters and through messengers, his uh, ministry team members who would relay the news from him to them and from them to him. And with the Philippians, he had received good news. They were solid. They were full of love and good fruit for the kingdom. They were faithful disciples of Jesus and loyal friends and partners of Paul. Not all the churches were like that, but the Philippian church was just a rock-solid church. So they were with him, in verse 3 he says, in his memory, in his mind, and that made him thankful, and that made his prayers full of joy. But it was deeper than that. Uh, He loved them. They were not only in his mind, but verse 7 says, in his heart as well. He says, for it is only right for me to feel this way about you all because I have you in my heart, since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers of grace with me. For God is my witness how I long for you with all the affection of Christ Jesus. So we said last time that Paul had this great capacity for love, and that's important in order to maintain joy, because when your attention is off yourself, it's easier to find contentment and joy in thinking about others and doing for them. So two weeks ago, I finished the first part of Philippians by only reading the prayer that Paul offers at the end of this opening portion of the letter. And we didn't look at it in any depth at all, but today I want to do just that. The prayer is amazing, uh, it's beautiful, and it deserves a very careful look. For me, Paul's prayers are a constant source of wonder. They have so much depth and a true understanding of life in Christ. And they're some of the most ignored parts of Scripture, though. Uh, Why is that? Well, I think because when we read the Bible, we're usually looking for commands or doctrines. Uh, We ask the text, what should I do? Or what am I supposed to believe? And we tend to skim over the prayers. We just kind of read through them. I I think because they seem superfluous, sort of like the, uh, at the end of Paul's books, when he's greeting people, we just kind of go through that. It's like, it's more like a more personal reflection when he's offering a prayer for them. We don't pay that much attention to them. But if we skim over the prayers, we're making a big mistake. They are rich They are deep. They point the way for our Christian life at least as much as the other portions of Scripture having to do with what we should do or what we should believe. Teaching truths or exhorting us to actions, the prayers are just as important as that. A prayer tells a believer exactly where he needs to be, what to focus on, and how to direct his energies to become all that God wants him to be. So Paul starts by praying for the Philippians to grow in love. So we're in verse 9 through 11. Verse 9, And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more. Now this was already a loving church. AFBC is a loving church. I keep hearing from people, which is always good for me to hear. But you know what? There can't be too much love in a church. Not among believers. Christians should always strive abound more and more in love. That's our first and highest duty. Jesus said in John thirteen thirty five at the Last Supper, he said, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So love among believers is a signature mark of our being people who have known Jesus. But folks, uh, far too often Christians fail in love. Church folks can be rude, judgmental, 
unkind, harsh, needlessly difficult, and unforgiving. Now, sometimes that because that's because churches have unregenerate people in them. Unregenerate means they've never been born again. They're only once born. They're people of the flesh. They just hang out at church and they consider themselves Christians, but they're not in Christ. But the truth is, enough real Christians also fail in love that uh, we need to grow in that and to abound more and more in love. It's, it's just our own weakness, our, our failure to grow in Christ. It's very easy to do church work and religious activity, as Paul would say, in the flesh, you know, not being spiritually grounded or spiritually motivated, just kind of going through the motions of it. That's not uncommon. I found myself doing that before. Uh, we're all in danger of slipping, and, and sometimes we sort of plateau out in our spiritual life instead of growing and going up. It's very easy to uh, fall into that. We're kind of coasting on the past, um, not living daily with Christ now, and we need to do that daily. I think almost everybody goes through periods like that. Our flesh can reassert itself in our, our thinking and then in our behavior, and we say and we do wrong things. But it's not always what we call sins of commission, things we actually do that are wrong. I think we're less inclined to be cruel than we are to just let things sort of slip. Many of you are so kind and so proactive. That's why our, our church has a reputation for being a loving church. You go out of your way to love people and minister to them. Somebody called me yesterday and just said how loved they feel in the church because so many people contact them, think about them, pray for them. And uh, But sometimes we're too distracted or too busy or just too lazy, and we don't follow through. So Paul says, this I pray that your love may abound more and more. So let's talk about love. I, I, I'm going to not just assume that we know exactly what kind of love we're talking about. Christians should know this, but um, the English word love has so many meanings. It's frustrating to even use the word sometimes. It could mean romance. It could mean friendship. It could mean devotion. It could mean obsession. Uh, it could mean self-sacrifice in the noblest way. I love you so much, Marsha. That's one kind of love. Boy, that guy really loves his cars. That's another kind of love. I just love my cat. That's another kind of love. So we use love for so many different shades of emotion, and some of them are very different from others. The word here is the common New Testament word, agape, a word which is really co-opted and used by Jesus and the church. In, in classical Greek, it really just sort of meant fondness for or affection for, but the New Testament defines it, and that gives it a much richer and deeper meaning, and so it's always had that deeper meaning since Jesus came. Um, of course, Paul describes it in 1 Corinthians 13 in very practical ways, mainly saying what love isn't. He says, love is patient, love is kind, it is not jealous, it does not brag, it is not arrogant, it does not act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own, it's not provoked, it doesn't take into account a wrong suffered, it does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but does rejoice in the truth. In other words, love is careful to honor and protect and care for other people. Love is not deceptive, and it doesn't seek advantage over others. It looks out for the well-being of others. Love is others-oriented for their good. So Jesus used it um, because it was in the first and the second commandments that he said were the most important commandments. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's the agape word. And then the second commandment, he said, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That also is the agape word. Uh, commitment, care, honor. Agape is others-oriented. It's the opposite of obsessive love or um, possessive love. It's not about self. It's about, the, it's about the good of the other person. So it always seeks what's best for the one loved. And if you find yourself being selfish, you're not loving. So um, I know popular culture says to love yourself. You already love yourself more than enough. Um, the goal is to love other people as much as you love yourself. So that's the kind of love we are to abound in more and more, agape love, Christian love. Now, to expand more on that, Paul in Philippians 1.9 expands on how that love operates with two very important words, okay? He doesn't say just abound more and more in love. He says abound more and more in love 
in real knowledge and all discernment. So Paul wants our love to abound more and more in real knowledge and all discernment. We don't usually associate those words in our culture with the word love, but if love is wanting what is best for the one loved, my friend, my spouse, my family, my brother or sister in Christ, my enemy, I need I need to not be awash in emotions. Emotions can't be guiding what I do and how I love. In fact, emotion is minimally important in agape love. It's actually being a, a benefit or a blessing, right? So you don't have to feel it as much as you have to do it. Obviously, there should be compassion behind it. In fact, the most common emotion word used of Jesus in the New Testament uh, in, in his ministry and his life in the Gospels is the word compassion. So compassion is the driving motivation, but the agape love is the doing of what's right or not doing what's wrong to the other person. Love is acting for the good of others, and that needs to be done with real knowledge and all discernment. You can't just have compassion and good intent. Love has to be wise. It needs to be rooted in truth. So that word real knowledge is kind of an interesting Greek word. The word gnosis is knowledge, and this is epinosis. It's kind of an emphasis on, on this true knowledge, if you will, or real knowledge, as it says in my translation. And that means to be well-informed about what God has revealed. You want to have God's mind. That's why G Paul says to let the word of Christ richly dwell within us so that, that our minds think biblically. Love has to be biblically informed or it can very easily get off track. I read an excellent ar article this week by um, Abigail Dodds, and it was on empathy. So I, I kind of wanted to read that. And she titled it, The Beauty and Abuse of Empathy. Now, we always think empathy is good, right? I mean, it's a good thing. It's, I've never heard anybody say empathy was bad, but she's saying it can be abused. Really connecting and feeling with what others are feeling. That's, that's what empathy is, right? You, you, you're so in tune with them that you kind of feel what they feel. It, it touches you very deeply. But what if what they are feeling is wrong? Or what if what they are feeling is self-destructive? What if what they're feeling is sinful? According to psychology, women are more empathetic than men by psychological standards. And it's part of what makes women mothers, actually, this ability to identify with their children's suffering or trouble. And Mrs. Dodds, when she was uh, writing this article, she begins it with the story of having to take her child, who has some um, issues, uh, for a medical checkup and they needed to put an IV in. And of course he was completely resistant. He was freaking out. Yeah, actually that actually happened to us once in a hospital and uh, around the Grand Canyon, but I won't tell that story right now. But um, she, uh, she had to do that for her child and the, the child was extremely re resistant, but that she started to think about that. And she asked a good question. What if she gave in to her child's desires and didn't put the IV in? She says, rather than doing what my rational mind knows is best for him, I instead would value what he feels is best as the highest good. His immediate comfort becomes the goal rather than his long-term health. What went wrong? I untethered empathy from reality, from truth. And just like truth without the gentleness of love can do damage, so also empathy untethered from truth selfishly poses as love. This isolated empathy makes love into a noodle, a jellyfish, an irrational blob. That's her words. It can feel someone's pain and shed rivers of tears, but it has no desire to do the uncomfortable work of digging out of the pit or enduring the IV pokes. That is so true in so many different situations, much more serious situations than just giving an IV to a child. Christians can sometimes easily delude themselves into thinking a sinful course of action is the best thing because they're more concerned about their happiness than they are about pleasing God. And she uses the example of a friend in a difficult marriage seeking an unbiblical divorce and 
taking up with a more understanding man than her husband. Empathy, disconnected from knowledge, feels her pain in her bad marriage that she suffered. And it wants to stop the hurt. So that kind of empathy says something like, yes, I understand you have suffered too much. But Mrs. Dodds says, if you, quote, don't address the sin along with your compassion, that is cowardly empathy. It's easy to empathize. It's hard to speak the truth. She writes, those who make a habit of feeling sorry for others caught in sin, in tearful solidarity and nothing else, are actually using others, not loving them. What they gain in doing so is the tasty inner treat of being seen as non-judgmental and compassionate, a safe space. When in reality, their lack of courage to speak the truth has left the other exposed. The empathetic friend has posed herself as more compassionate than God. And in so doing, she has become a glory thief. Wow. That is so true. She's so right. I don't think I've ever thought of it that way, but I think she's right on with that. This other expression Paul uses along with real knowledge is all discernment. So love has to be inseparable from knowledge and discernment. What is discernment? Well, it's the ability of the mind and the heart to tell good from evil or the important from the unimportant or the beneficial from the harmful. And the Greek word here is where we get our word aesthetics. And we usually use aesthetics with regard to art and music and things like that. We're talking about seeing what is excellent, you know, being able to discern what is excellent in painting or sculpture or things like that. The Greeks are all into that kind of thing. But this word goes beyond just things we create. There's a moral dimension to it, a spiritual dimension to it. It's what is right and fitting, what actually belongs, or or for a Christian, it would be what is God-honoring. That's the fitting, right, appropriate thing. So this ability to distinguish is a mark of spiritual maturity. Spiritually, we discern what is wise and good and honorable based on the commands and the principles of Scripture. And you can see that thought developed even more there in verse 10, where Paul says, so that you may approve the things that are excellent. So God wants us to discern and approve of the most excellent things. All things are not equal. All roads are not the same. All choices are not the best. I think we all agree that a mature mind can generally discern what things are better and what things are worse. That's sort of the definition of maturity. As Christians, we do that by seeking God's perspective and evaluating everything according to that perspective. And as ambassadors for Christ, his representatives, we need to be known for mature thinking and not emotionalism. William Hendrickson, the great Bible commentator in his commentary on Philippians says, a person who possesses love but lacks discernment may reveal a great deal of eagerness and enthusiasm. He may donate to all kinds of causes. His motives may be worthy and his intentions honorable, yet he may be doing more harm than good. If you give a lot of your money to a ministry that is deceptive, exploitative, and doesn't teach the Word of God properly, you're not doing good. You might feel like you're doing good, and you might be all excited about that, but you're not doing good. You're doing harm. Just because somebody's on TV or has written a book doesn't mean that they're right. So discernment is very important in evaluating who we hear, who we listen to, who we recommend. In fact, People on TV, the splashier the show, uh, the more likely you're dealing with a charlatan or a hustler. So you really want to be careful about those kind of things. Remember Jim and Tammy Faye Baker, you know, Tammy Faye with the the eyebrows and the the caked on makeup? Very, very popular TV ministry when I was a younger person. Massively wealthy because they were crooked. And it was obvious if you just watched their show that they were manipulative errant, um, unbiblical, hucksters, but millions of people followed them and sent them tons of money. You didn't have to be a genius to figure that out. You just had to have a mature, biblically informed mind um, to really see how depraved that whole situation was. Well, Jim Baker, of course, he went to prison, not for Christ, but for crimes that he committed. He was a fraud artist. 
And then he wrote a book in 1996 from prison called I Was Wrong. Here's actually the blurb that's on the back of the book. Now with honesty and frankness, the 48-year-old man sentenced to 45 years in prison on charges related to his PTL Heritage USA ministry shares the intimate details of his incarceration, his divorce, the mistakes he made along the way. The book also contains candid and hard-hitting insights on his new perspective on the dangers of prosperity theology and the seductive nature of power. More than just another celebrity biography, this is an important book for anyone struggling with lust, money, power, greed, divorce, and brokenness. Includes a 16-page photo insert. Did you hear the word sin in that little blurb? Because I didn't. I heard mistakes. You know, it's really nice to say I was wrong because he was so obviously wrong, but he sinned a lot. I just saw this week uh, an investigative report on him today because he's back at it 24 years later. He's back on TV selling survival gear for the apocalypse. And his show is called Prophecy News Watch. And he has on many of today's most popular false prophets, kind of the second tier false prophets. And he sells a lot of worthless junk for very steep prices, unbelievably uh, worthless junk. And he started selling a cure for the coronavirus very recently. That's why his name got back into the media. And he said recently, he said, God spoke to me in the prison. This virus could be the last of the four horses. This is what it's about. And then he has a guy in his show saying 1.5 billion people could probably die from the coronavirus, which is totally bogus. And he said, you won't be able to leave your house for years. And so you should buy these four tubs of survival food for only $1,600. And then he has a lady on selling colloidal silver solution, which is a cure. It's a cure. You can get two 16-ounce liquids, two 4-ounce gels, and three silver lozenges for only $125. This lady on his show actually says, although it hasn't been tested on this coronavirus, it has cured other coronaviruses. It totally eliminated it within 12 hours. He stopped selling it because the government sued him for fraud, for posting, a, uh, promoting a fraudulent cure for something that is no... Collodial, collodial silver does not cure coronaviruses. There's zero evidence for that. Zero. So that's, that's a big, obvious example of the need for discernment. But discernment is needed every day, not only in those kind of things, but just our everyday lives. In big ways and small ways, we have to be discerning people, abounding in love, but with real knowledge and all discernment so that we may approve the things that are excellent. You don't want to approve of things that are not excellent. You want to approve of things that are excellent. There's more. Verse 10. In order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ. Sincere means being the genuine article. And blameless means not causing other people to stumble. Sincere means real. Blameless means not tripping up others. So we're ready to stand before our Lord, having dealt with our sin, having used wisdom to direct our love, and humbly pointed other people to the truth. That's how we want to come and stand before Jesus Christ, having lived that kind of life, a discerning life, abounding in love. So your life needs to count for Jesus by practicing love guided by real knowledge and all discernment. There's just too much foolishness in our world. And there's way too much foolishness in the church world. You have to be discerning and not fall for a lot of unbiblical nonsense. Can Satan achieve any greater victory than to make Christians foolish in the eyes of the world and naive? Don't let him do that to you. Be mature in your thinking. Be biblical, well-grounded in Scripture. People that don't know Christ they don't need to see a perfect you, but they do need to see a mature person, a right-thinking person, a person not given to foolishness. That's what they need to see. Our growth in Christ has to be real and detectable to the watching world. They need to see humility and kindness, faith and reason. So just go back to the previous example of Mr. Baker and 
This is how discernment actually works. If somebody's been in the ministry for years and has become vastly wealthy, you're probably wise to not regard that person as a person of substance. Be very suspicious. And if they go to prison for fraud after years of Christian work and Christian ministry, you will have realized that your use of discernment was right all along. And you can pray for that person's repentance. But if that person writes a book called I Was Wrong, forgive him, but never trust him to be in the ministry again because he would know that that's not an appropriate place for him. If he returns to TV as a huckster again, claiming divine revelation and cheating people out of their hard-earned dollars, mark that person down as a servant of the evil one because that's what they really are. He is a reproach to the most holy name of all, Jesus Christ, by misusing it every day. He mocks the king. So practice discernment that you may approve the things that are excellent. Especially pay attention to the misuse of scripture and subtle ways that people exalt themselves as though they are closer to God than you are. If you see those things, run far away. Shun them. Okay, Paul's not done yet. He's got a little bit more. Verse 11. Having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ. You know, you can't be righteous before God apart from Christ. You stand before God in the righteousness of Christ. It's actually credited to you, his righteousness, when you put your faith in him. In the same way, the fruit of righteousness, that's what he's talking about here, the fruit of righteousness cannot grow apart from Christ. It doesn't just happen. You have to be in an active, living relationship with him every day. Jesus said it best himself. Again, Uh, John, John's gospel, John chapter 15, verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, of course, you can do things, but nothing of substance, nothing of eternal value, nothing that's going to last. Nothing like the fruit of righteousness. That can only be done in Christ So this love has to be his love in us. His love must abound through us and his wisdom must be planted deeply within within us. And as we walk with Christ and we grow in love and discernment, then the final piece of Paul's prayer comes into fruition. Verse 11, God is glorified. Having been filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So your life, your everyday life should result in praise and glory to God. Even unbelievers often, not always, but often will think well of Christ if they see in you a love that abounds more and more, shown in good deeds and in kindness, guided by real knowledge and all discernment. That just makes you a person of quality, and people are drawn to that. And they know you're a Christian rebounds to the glory and the praise of God that you're seen that way. Most people are looking for something genuine. They really are. And discernment and knowledge and love help make you a genuine person, somebody that can be trusted. That glorifies God. It glorifies God for his people to be wise and discerning. It glorifies God to be a person that's not easily taken in. It glorifies God to use the word of God to evaluate situations rather than your emotions. It glorifies God to have wisdom direct love in the right way. It glorifies God to define love biblically, not culturally. To say it really simply, maturity in Christ leads to God being glorified. That's why you exist on earth. So make your life an answer to Paul's prayer and bring glory to God by shaping your life by these things. Let's pray. Lord, you have shown us the way right here. Help us to grow in real knowledge and all discernment. Help us see the importance of wisdom and to seek it for ourselves. Let our feelings be ruled by solid thinking, rooted deeply in your word. This we ask in the name of our glorious Savior, who we want to see glorified and magnified in our lives. In his name we pray, amen. All right.
God bless you. We'll see you next time.